what was more to come was the Supper Theater Productions we've heard a little about tonight. We did the first one that year, directed by Rose Backage and Nanan Tigat. Many people worked on these shows. Menus were devised, the home econ classes, cooked in the lunchroom facilities, and the shows were a success. And all of this was possible because Jack pushed everyone to do their best and find out what they could accomplish. So many students had a chance to take responsibilities that were pretty rare opportunities for high school students. And these opportunities turned into life lessons and of course foundations for some pretty amazing futures for these kids. For Shakespeare that year, we produced Much Ado About Nothing, and it was another big show. It featured uh, uh, Don McManus, Greg Dubray, Janet Brinkley, Jeff Dent, Larry Hess, Larry Orr, Mark Linder, Rose Backage, and Bonnie Haviland. Uh, Don McManus was one of many students who appeared in TV and films after Kearney High. Mark Linder and Cindy Reinstein played an elderly couple in an unknown show. Uh, we do know that they won a superior rating at Mesa and a first place in a regional competition. And if you know the name of the show, can you shout it out, please? I'm Herbert. <laughs> nice to meet you, Herbert. <laughs> okay, now we're in Arthur Miller. Arthur Miller's The Crucible was another great American classic drama with great lessons uh, to be learned. Strong performances were created by T.K. Argenbright, Charles Booth, Dan Whitworth, Greg Dubray, Janet Brinkley, Karen Bowman, Kim Nolan, Larry Hess, Mark Linder, Robin Imhoff, Rose Backage, Roxanne Hoffert. Jack said that Julius Caesar was the toughest Shakespeare he ever tried to do. You think? <laughs> <laughs> but he had some excellent talent, thank God, to work with. Uh, T.K. Argenbright, Charles Booth, Dan Whitworth, Greg Dubray, Janet Brinkley, Karen Bowman, Kim Nolan, Larry Hess, Mark Linder, Robin Imhoff. I feel like I'm at the end of the Academy Awards. <laughs> Rose Backish and Roxanne Hoffert, among others. Um, okay, so we're skipping that. And then we moved to 1977, Juno and the Paycock. That was the first show that I was privileged to observe from the audience. Another drama featuring the amazing Nanan Tigat, Ron Jones, David Horner. Is he here tonight? David Horner. Okay. Roxanne Hoffert, um, Emma O'Neill, Marcus Boyd, and then Nanan went on to follow her father's footsteps as a professional dance teacher, choreographer, director, and performer, and a well-known San Diego theater pro. Then we went on to Twelfth Night, which was that year's Shakespearean production. And I have to tell you, um, as a sophomore, I was privileged and honored to, um, to get the leading role in that play, but it wasn't because I was talented, it was because Marcus Boyd and I were, looked like we could be twins. <laughs> Remember that? So they called for twins, so thank God I look like Marcus Boyd. Okay. <laughs> and Marcus Boyd was going to be here tonight, but um, unfortunately he was involved in a motorcycle accident. Oh, wow. and he is in the hospital. He's going to be okay, but um, he is getting a cast put on right now. <laughs> and then of course, Twelfth Night would not have been the same without Ryan Hagen's in his tights. <laughs> All right, uh, come back, little Sheba brought back Christy Stiles, Tracy Alexander, and Doug Huntington. The Prisoner of Second Avenue broke out Kenny Maskell, Valerie McGraw, and Anita Feldman. Supper Theater, Doug, we had Bring in the Clowns. Bring in the Clowns. All right, well, without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to introduce to you Larry Orr. Larry graduated with a BA from San Diego State in education and actually led, which was led to a semester of student teaching under Mr. Winans. Um, he is now an English teacher and a drama teacher and at North High School in Bakersfield, and he's been doing that for 21 years. Wow. Well, Jack, we go back a long way. Not quite as far back as some of these people here tonight, but that's because they're old. <laughs> <laughs> but being here, though, makes us all feel young. 
and I remember as a sophomore I signed up for your most advanced drama class. I decided I was going to prove myself worthy right away. Uh, I struggled a bit that first year. You gave me some opportunities. I had some successes. But it wasn't until my junior year that I really felt like I had accomplished something here. Uh, I remember walking down that hall, getting ready to go to class. Just before I turned the door into the mini theater, BAM! I was slammed up against the wall by a 43-year-old short guy. <laughs> Jack liked to wrestle. <laughs> and I'd seen him go at it with guys like Mike Longton for several <laughs> minutes at a time in that hallway. And I knew, or I felt, when Jack slammed me into the wall, now I knew I was a go-to guy for Kearney drama. <laughs> Jack, you taught me about dedication to theater, even at the expense of other programs. You remember uh, when I was playing Laertes in Hamlet? I was also involved in ROTC. I was on the drill team, the color guard, uh, the rifle team. They needed me. I was also up for a promotion. But Sergeant Smith said, uh, you're not going to become an officer if you don't cut that hair. And I said, well, I can't. I'm in a play, we open this week. Well, you've got a decision to make. So, I was in a dilemma. I had to talk to my director to find out his words of wisdom. I said, Jack, should I cut my hair? And I remember his very measured response was, hell no! <laughs> So, I, uh, I did not cut my hair. I also uh, eventually dropped out of ROTC, did not make officer, but I did let those locks fly on the Cal State Northridge stage in our production of Hamlet. Up there. Uh, Jack, you were a mentor even after I finished high school. We had done much ado about nothing. Uh, the spring of 75. Boy, I thought I was on top of the acting world and conquered everything. Shortly after that, you seized another opportunity to teach me something. You invited me to a production of Much Ado at the Globe, featuring Ellis Rabb as Benedict. I remember sitting there several times saying, Jack, that's how you do it. And Jack would just Wag his head and smile. <laughs> he knew. Ten years later, you mentored me here at Kearney as my master teacher. Helped me develop abilities at teaching theater to students, high school students. Soon you would turn the reins of your classroom over to me so that you could do other really important teacher things like shooting baskets in the gym. <laughs> now, you were really working. You told me your shooting percentage shot way up, so. <laughs> we kept in touch over the years. You came to visit friends in Bakersfield, and we had you and Bobby over for breakfast, if you remember. Uh, you attended my production of Of Mice and Men, had the opportunity to mentor my own student actors. Uh, one of them, you warmed up with him backstage by reciting some dialogue from that play. Remember that? No. <laughs> well, I do. That's right. That's right. We did that too. I certainly did. Got the program to prove it. Uh, well, you know, my, my students still get a kick when they come into my office and they see this picture of Jack Winans on the, on the board. They say, who's that? And I say with pride, that's my high school drama teacher. And they say, wow. I'll let you interpret what wow means. <laughs> Jack, you've been a daily remembrance to me uh, for over 21 years as I have repeated phrases that I first heard from you. Concentrate! Pick it up. Diction. Right? Project, right? Uh, but perhaps the most important, uh, or the most often remembered uh, 
thing that I have from you, Jack, is uh, how you balanced your work with your family life. You know, you kept the world of play production a family operation. For each play, as all of you can attest to, there was Bobby coming along, fitting people for costumes, as we talked about a lot tonight, and not enough. Sometimes Johnny was there, often. And I realized when I became a theater teacher that that was what was necessary to, to keep your family involved in all of these extra hours that you're going to be spending away from home. And so my lovely wife, Anne, has helped me as Bobby helped you in costuming and set painting and music rehearsals with the kids. And, uh, and six of my of our seven children have come through wow. North High's drama program um, as a family affair. And I want you to know that, um, that that example that you set for me has been a, will be a cyclical thing. It continues on, Jack. <laughs> it's all in the family, it continues on. And so with that, I thank you for all that you've done for me and for all of us here tonight and the many things that we'll take with us forever. Thanks, Jack. That's my wife, Ann, right there, Ann Jacobson. Class of 74. <clears throat> well, after graduating in 1979, Tracy went on to earn her BA degree in speech communication with an emphasis in public speaking from SDSU. Her friends call her Miss Congeniality after the movie because in 1980 she was fairest of the fair and then Miss San Diego America in 1984. She then switched gears to the martial arts and earned a black belt. Currently, Tracy owns Play It Safe Defense and teaches self-defense to children and women. Her children's class was featured on Dr. Phil. Tracy? All right, well, thank you, and thank you, Mr. Winans. My sister was supposed to be with, uh, with me tonight. We had a little comedy roast that we were going to do, and my father uh, fell ill this evening, so I'm going to do this on my own, and then I'm actually going to be her understudy for the next segment. But um, I, uh, like, I, would, I have to say probably one of the biggest lessons that I learned from you, Mr. Winans, is the improvisation. And I know, I'm sure all of you would agree that we take that with us in life. Every, life is an improv. We never know what's going to come our way, what's going to be said, and we just have to make do with what life throws at us. So I've learned how to pick people's lines up. I've had people pick my lines up for me, and um, that's what I'm gonna do right now. And I'd like to start by just saying some of the things that I've learned from you, Mr. Winans. I learned that uh, being a drama queen isn't really a good thing. <laughs> Ask my husband, yeah. I learned that when you told me you were going to cast me as the ingenue, it wasn't a pair. <laughs> I learned that a monologue was not a deadly disease I would catch from a cast member. <laughs> Was a big one. You taught us 50 ways to say I love you. Remember that? I love you. I love you. I love you. And then the one I use on my husband. I love you. I learned from you that I can't sing. It's true. I learned the best way to torture teenagers. Put the boys in tights. Yeah. and make the girls kiss guys in front of the entire school. How many of you had to kiss somebody in front of the school? Yeah. My sister was going to actually tell you that her guy was a bad kisser, but I'm glad she's not here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I learned timing. Oh my gosh. How many of you have done this to your kids? Come on, let's go. Go, go, go. Come on, get in the car. Come on, let's go. Remember that? Put the finger. And project! If I had a dollar for every time I heard project, I would be a rich woman. But it's kind of cool now you use that in my classes when we tell her that we teach the kids to say, back off! I got that from 
I'm used to women. So. <laughs> Okay. And Bobby, I am convinced that if Gianna Jackson had you and Nancy Grace, we never would have had the term wardrobe malfunction. So these are some of the life lessons that, that, that I've taken with me, thanks to you. And um, in conclusion, I do want to say that the great director, God, um, I know he puts people in your life for a reason. He has a he has a plan for all of us, and it's amazing. He knew before I met you that you needed to be in my life because I've taken so much from you, and I've applied it to uh, to my work now. I, we actually teach children through acting how what to do um, in bully situations and and what to do if they're confronted with a bad stranger, and it, and it's all through acting and role play. But um, so I see God's fingerprints all over my life, and um, you. Where you were meant to be, you were you put in my life for a reason, and I thank you for it, and I love you. <laughs> we have the video. Yes. Um, our next uh, video. After he graduated in 1976, Greg Dubre earned a degree in electronics, and for the past 30 years he has made a career working for television stations in Sacramento as an engineer. He has been happily married to Cynthia Tibbs, a Kearney graduate of 1978. Together they have two children and recently have become grandparents. Greg now works doing television for the legislature. Well, Jack, I just wanted to let you know what a profound influence you've had on my life. It's been over 35 years since my days of Kearney, but it feels like it was just yesterday. And I still remember the countless hours I spent on stage under your direction. You know, you always inspired me to be at my best, and encouraged me to be responsible, hardworking, and dedicated to excellence in all aspects of my life. Now, these are qualities that are best taught by example. And for that example, so many years ago, I'm truly grateful. It's because of you that I have and always will strive to give them hell. Thanks, Jack. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you. Tony yep, Tony Stallworth. Come on, yeah. Test, test. You know, Jack, you always had me get into uh, my character mode, so please excuse me. I think to myself 
what a wonderful boy. The colors of the rainbow, so pretty in the sky, is also on the faces of people's best and back. I see friends taking in, I see and have to do. Silvestre and Terry Axe and Tracy Alexander. Oh, I wasn't in that play. <laughs> <laughs> There's a long story behind that. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> Straight Scene, another great American play. That one I was in with Terry Axe, Marshall Silvestre, Kenny Maskell, Monica, you were with us, and of course my sister Lisa. Mini Theater is back with Raisin in the Sun and Bad Seed, which are not related, by the way. Then there was the Mad Woman of Chaillot, a challenging show, but to these young people who were up to it, Tony DiCarlo, Mark Ashley, the talented Kim Hatch, Ken Jones, and myself. We were good Mad Women. <laughs> The Sucker Club served up New York, New York. The menu was, of course, New York steak. The show, of course, was tasty. As you see, as you can see, the next generation of Jack's talent pool had brought plenty of replenishment. The Glass Menagerie was an excellent production with strong performances by Tony DiCarlo, Michelle Toscano, Lucy Boyd, and Ken Jones. Going for a challenge, Jack brings in Streetcar Named Desire, which brings in some new names with the regulars, Tony DiCarlo, Kim Hatch, Mark Salazar, Mark Ashley, and I believe my sister was in that play, right? Lisa Alexander. <laughs> Rainmaker gives these young actors a crack at a great play. Tony DiCarlo, Mark Salazar, Michelle Toscano, and Mark Ashley. Hmm. Is a view from the bridge one of Jack's favorite plays? Well, it must be. This second production featured Tony DiCarlo, Mark Salazar, Debbie Henley, who's here tonight, uh, Michelle Toscano, Alfredo Noche, and Doug Sampson. Spoon River 2 must also be one of Jack's favorites, this time with Mark Salazar, Yvonne <coughs> Parker, Debbie Hanley, <coughs> Betty Mesker, Alfredo Noche, and John Bilberg. The singers were Mike Schreiber and Andy Bitsy. Subject was Roses, brought new talent to these boards. Michael DeLeon, Mary Goldcamp, Jody Waring. They took on some deep issues and difficult roles in this Pulitzer Prize drama. They Knew What They Wanted was also a Pulitzer Prize winner for drama and is the basis for the musical Most Happy Fellow. Our production featured Curtis Brown, Mary Goldcamp, and many others. Great. And it is my pleasure to introduce Monica Showalter. She's going to come over here and give a tribute to Mr. Winans. And um, I'm really excited to share her bio with you. She is the editorial writer at Investors Business Daily. She's appeared on Fox News, CNBC, um, and many numerous radio shows, including Rush Lim Limbaugh. And she went to Columbia with Condoleezza Rice in 2008. 
very impressive. My name is Monica Showalter, and Mr. Winans is one teacher I have looked back and have always thought to myself, this is someone I have wanted to thank, and I've been thrilled to have this opportunity. Um, the lessons he taught were extremely valuable in life, and you recall them as you go through life, and I've always wanted to say thanks. It's not just the teamwork that good drama will develop, because students work together and we develop that work as a team, same as a soccer team, but it, it becomes a team that creates something. Um, it was also the sense that Mr. Winans gave us, that every player was important and every role was important. He underlined this very strongly, and this uh, was, was extremely good for building this kind of teamwork. Um, and the other thing is, he gave us great confidence. We were able to put on amazing shows that looked extremely professional and uh, were a great pleasure and we drew big audiences. Um, this gave us wonderful confidence. To this day, nobody has any trouble getting up and speaking before a room. And this is something you notice. Most people are afraid of that, but we are not. It's just the nuts and bolts of drama and that sort of thing. But there was something very unexpected we also learned from having Mr. Winans too as a teacher, and that's it. As actors, we were mostly interested in expressing ourselves, and maybe we thought to Hollywood as, as our next step. But something different happened with me. I became a journalist, and I'm going to New York, and suddenly I realize I, I am not a rube in New York. I can relate to New York. I can relate to the walls. I know what a brownstone is. I know what the Jewish community is. I know the tales of the immigrants, but I also know the tales of, of the, uh, the Park Avenue co-ops and this sort of thing, and how people lived, because we acted in plays like The Prisoner of Second Avenue. Uh, the other thing is, because we knew this, we also knew the literature. We knew the plays of Neil Simon, and we knew Elmer Rice. We knew some of these great, William Inge, these greats of theater that were taught nowhere else. I mean, I was an English major. We, would ever, we were never exposed to this sort of thing. Uh, there was always certain kinds of curriculums, but this is a neglected area that's very, very valuable, and it's essential to our heritage. Basically, you're not cultured if you don't know this stuff. Uh, so this was a great gift to have, because even if you're going to New York and you don't quite know what, where it is, you are knowledgeable, and you are not a rude. And that was exceptionally valuable. It's, it's because it's part of our heritage and culture. Um, I suppose you could get through life without knowing them. But it was a great enhancement to have this knowledge and this cultural literacy. Uh, you learn it as you're, you're going. And this is why you get invited to fancy dinner parties when other people do not. It's because you do have uh, the knowledge that powerful people have, or people who are beyond your generation. It's because of just disappeared. We're in San Diego. We don't have that exposure, but you do have that exposure when, because we dealt with Mr. Winans and, and the things that he taught us and imparted to us. As I walked through New York's glittery skyscrapers, I did think of Mr. Winans. This was maybe in the 90s. I said, if there was just one teacher I could say thanks to, it would be Mr. Winans. Um, it occurred to me that just so much had context to me. Uh, and uh, more important, I could talk to people and relate to people and communicate with them. And that knowledge extended my understanding well beyond my experience. In reality, I, I think all students should have this knowledge. I think it needs to be imparted because it is who we is. But it ensures that we are not strangers in our own country. And for this, I feel a great debt of gratitude for the unique value and learning from Mr. Winans. Thank you so much. I'd like to call up Bill Groom. What are we doing, John? Oh, I have John Collins. John, okay. And he is, he has graduated from Kearney High School in 1972. And he is, uh, has a master's degree from San Diego State University in Education Administration, as well as a doctorate uh, in 2004. He's taught television production and high school English in the San Diego City Schools from 1976 to 1989.
did not prepare a speech. And I'm glad I didn't because I'd have to cut it all right now. <laughs> I'm here to talk about your influence on me, and, on, and Phil's going to speak, I think, in a moment, about those of us who decided to go into education and to become teachers. That's what you taught me. You taught me the importance of being a teacher who cared for the individuals. You taught me that it doesn't matter who walks in that door, we're going to teach them. And it doesn't matter their life circumstances. It doesn't matter um, the way they look, the way they act, the way they speak. They're valuable people, and we all have gifts. And you've helped us to find our gifts and to find our voices. You taught me the power of the spoken word, and that has served me well in my career, very well. You've taught me to respect the spoken word and to be careful how you use the spoken word, and that it's not just about the word. It's about the intonation about the timing, the tempo, and the emphasis. Those things have served us all well, and we've used those in our careers. I'm no longer in San Diego Unified, I'm now up in Poway Unified. Um, I was a high school principal, and one of my biggest things there was to ensure, and that's why I went to Poway, is that the arts are never lost in our schools. Because our kids need more than just the academics. And some of us who weren't real strong in the academics found our lives in the extracurricular and the co-curricular, and that's so important to our kids. So now a superintendent of the school district, 34,000 kids I'm responsible for. I keep those lessons from you, and I remember what it means to be a good teacher. And it's not about the subject matter. Some people will say, what do you teach? And they'll say, I teach English, or I teach math, or I teach science. But what you taught me is that's not what we teach. We teach who we are. We teach who we are through example, through the things we do for our students, and for the way we interact with them. And Jeannie Frazier said it earlier, you treated us like adults. You treated us respectfully. You treated us with trust. You pushed us. You held high expectations for us. And all of that is what helped me shape my world as a teacher. And Bobby, a couple stories very quickly. First of all, when this tall, skinny, troubled kid came onto this stage for the first time thinking, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> you got me into a pair of tights. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't going to go there. You convinced me that the melancholy Jake Waves, and as you like it, needed to be in green tights. And so I did green tights. And I spoke about all the world's stage and all the men and women merely players. But you also treated us like adults. The story I want to tell is we were rehearsing some show, and I don't know what it was, but we were here, as we always were, late or on a weekend, and there's nobody else on campus. And so during a break, I was in the back having a cigarette outside <laughs> with somebody, maybe one of you. <laughs> and Bobby comes around the corner, and I'm thinking, oh my god. You know, it's, it's Jack's wife, and I've got a cigarette. And she said, oh, just stop. Just come over here. I want to measure you. <laughs> she didn't care. She didn't care. She needed to get her measurement, and that's what was important. And for those of you who have been referring to this gentleman as Mr. Winans, well, in the 70s, we were a little more irreverent. It was J.R. You remember that? It was J.R. No, and now it's Jack. And now that I am older by about probably 17, 18 years, and you were when you taught me, I think I've earned the right to call you Jack and to call you my friend and to thank you for teaching me all those lessons about being a good teacher and about being a good person. Thank you, Jack. I don't know about you, but I'd love to see all you guys back in your tights. <laughs> I think you have a bio on me. Um, I'm Phil Grooms from class of 73. Um, I am a PE teacher in Southeast San Diego. And um, in Southeast San Diego, everybody coached Reggie Bush. Everybody's taking care of Reggie Bush. My question is, do you remember the other boys that were on your team? Do you remember those other kids, the Caterpillars? Do you remember them? Because when I was in high school, I was probably a Caterpillar. <laughs> Really. But this man still invested in me. 
And the reality of what you taught me never really came, came more to fruition in 1975, 76 when I started working with youth and I started having to become a communicator. I had to start performing musically, which I like to do. But people are like, where did you learn that? And so finally, the caterpillar sort of became a butterfly where suddenly everything you taught me became very, very powerful. And it, I, I can't even tell you how many times, speaking of words, every time I got before people, all, all I hear was clarity, annunciation, diction. <laughs> I'd hear that time and time again. And then in our classes, when I was getting my credential, the, you gotta build a community. In first period, first period drama, that's what we were. We were a community. We taught each other. When we did our, 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 our poems, our prose, our improvisations, we had to sit there and listen to what everybody else thought about us. Then we even had to tell ourselves, tell everybody what we thought, and then we had to hear from you. And they're saying, that's the new way of teaching. I go. We did that back in 1972 in Mr. Wyman's class. <laughs> and so I'm a PE teacher, but my class is a community, and it's a safe place. I have all these children go, oh, Coach Grooms, you don't know, understand. Yes, I do understand. <laughs> but my, I tell my kids, my class is going to be the happiest 50 minutes of your day. It's going to be a safe place, because I know that there's athletes, there's jocks, and there's caterpillars. <laughs> and I want it to be a safe place for you to learn to do the best you can. My PE class is like Mr. Rogers on steroids. It's, 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 a, it's a neighborhood, but kids learn about life because that's what you demonstrated to us. That it was more than just a subject matter, but that it's about life and its standards. You do not serve a child's self-esteem by letting them be mediocre. It doesn't serve anything, and so I hold it very, very high standards because, as you taught us, that we could never, ever understand our full heart if we only just keep using half our heart. So again, I'd like to thank you so much, Mr. Moynes, for everything you've taught us. Jack Wines when I came to Kearney High School in 1968. I figured this guy and I were miles apart, two different worlds. I was a jock, played football, coached football and wrestling, taught PE in the woodshop. Jack was into cultural things, the arts, drama, theater, acting and producing plays. It didn't take long for me to find out that we had a lot more in common than I ever imagined. I was a teacher and a football coach. Jack was a teacher and a drama coach. Jack conducted rehearsals for his productions. My team had to rehearse the plays we were going to run in the games on Friday night. Jack's classes had to build sets for the plays, and we often worked together in the woodshop classes. Before you knew it, I developed an interest in Jack's work with the drama department, and it all started with his production of, of Mice and Men. It was a great performance, and I started attending more of Kearney's plays. But Mice and Men also just happened to star two starters on our football team, John Perpich and Mike Longton. Another great athlete, Mark Hoagland, was also very active in Kearney's drama productions. Jack also had an interest in sports. He was the voice of the Comets. For years, he announced many of our football games at Mesa College. He also shared with me some of his experiences playing football and track when he was in high school. He is a tough competitor. During lunch at school, a bunch of us coaches played basketball in the gym almost every day. Guys like Joe Hernandez, Jerry Varner, Tom Fleming, Tim Short. Big guys and good athletes. 
Jack wanted to play with us. He was never intimidated. When Jack had the ball, he would run you over like a bull. <laughs> I could see that happening. I got bumped around a little, he got bumped around a little too, but he never backed down. We had fun and developed a lot of respect for him. I want to congratulate Jack for this honor being bestowed on him tonight. He is truly deserving. But I need to add, there is one thing that we do not have in common. I have never had an ex-student publish a book in New York City and dedicate it to me. Jack did. <laughs> back a thriller to our stage featuring Mary Goldcamp, Jennifer Frisbee, Michael DeLeon, and myself, Jody Waring. The Odd Couple was next with the Neil Simon comedy classic gave us Jody Waring, Michael Black, and Mary Goldcamp and others bringing Os Oscar and Felix to life. Bus Stop brought in some new faces to this American classic. Michelle Smith, Mary Williams, Mike Romero, Julie Peterson, Jody Waring, Kevin Angus, Greg DeMong, and Blaine Dapper. Agnes of God also added new faces to the talent pool. Michelle Smith, Sonny McDaniel, and Allie Rosenblum. Sonny stepped in three days before the show and did a fabulous job in a tough role. Supper Theater did Chorus Line. It was a hit because a good chorus line always is. Crimes of the Heart, a tragic comedy, is another Pulitzer Prize drama that challenged these young actors. Sherry Boone, Carrie Kendall, Linda Newell, Chris Seacrest, Kathy Senko, and Greg Phillips. Plaza Suite is a great comedy, but we are not sure who is in it. <laughs> we think it, it featured Linda Newell and Chris Seacrest. If anyone else knows, let us know. The Supper Theater produced Annie and West Side Story and pulled them off with excellence. Slow Dance on the Killing Ground brought out Brian Davis, Kathy Senko, Chris Seegers to do this challenging work. Their performances were exceptional. At SCETA, it placed third, only because a single judge gave it 20 points and the others gave it over 120. We were robbed! <laughs> <laughs> now we have a tribute by Jody Waring. After high school, I spent four years in the Army. During that time, I met my first wife and mother of my two eldest of three kids. Uh, I spent 13 years with sdg and &E. I have been a professional clown, and I've done some community theater, and been an extra in a movie. After many years in corporate America, I ultimately decided to get back into the entertainment business. Although it is the adult entertainment business, working in a casino, I also have a handsome six-year-old grandson. And I have to put these on. I used to give you crap about putting your glasses on, but time has a, ch a funny sense of humor. <laughs> Jack was and is a special person to many of us. He was a mentor, a father figure, and an educator. When I was first approached for this, my first thought was, Jack's not still teaching? He was the, one of those people who he just assumed would be teaching forever. Some of my fondest memories of Jack are of our yogurt runs during rehearsals and sometimes class, um, his dead husband scenes in class, and the razor monologue that I think of every time I shave, even 20-some <laughs> years later. Now, in our group, we had, of course, the standard cast of characters. We have the drama queen, the Casanova, the jocks and the nerds. Me, I was more of the comedian, willing to do anything for a laugh. And that's what Jack taught me. 
He told me, he taught me how to make them laugh, to let go of my fears, and to get away from junior theater acting. <laughs> he helped me open up from playing Mortimer in the dinner theater, Oscar and the Odd Couple, and even a drunk in Bus Stop. But most of all, he talked me into literally letting it all hang out, singing Hurley Burley from South Pacific. I think that's what started my love of musicals. Jack, you were my father figure. You were a mentor and an educator. He taught me lessons that have stayed with me throughout my life. And so Jack, for old time's sake, and as a, si as a sign to add just how special you are, <laughs> malfunction. Sorry, Bob. <laughs> okay. I think so. I just can't get these things straight. Okay. There we go. Okay. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Mary Goldcamp, who I have had the pleasure of working with many times while I was at Kearney. Mary Goldcamp graduated from Kearney in 1984. Since high school, she has continued in the theater, uh, in the theater through community theater, the Shakespeare Society, and num numerous other venues, including uh, attending SDSU and Mesa College Theater Department. I'm going to read this because if I don't, I'll start to cry and I really don't have any Kleenex. Mm -hmm. um, we have all met people who have shaped or molded our lives. People who have helped us up when we fell. People who have guided us to the correct decisions. Parents, family and friends, teachers. This is what Jack did for me. He helped me up and put me on stage. I really feel that he saved me from myself and what could have been some very bad decisions. Through theater, he helped me to find self-worth, to value myself and what I could do. Jack has a way, be it less than subtle, <laughs> to make you find yourself, to toss away the garbage and focus on what's going on in the present, the now. He also made me push my boundaries, which was very difficult for me. At 17, I was very difficult for everybody. Um, first, oh, I can't imagine what it was like for Jack. First to deal with teenagers in class on a daily basis, then on to two to three hours of rehearsals with highly charged emotional creatures, and then to see us all through productions. Many people have failed in the face of less. But he met it all and he did it very well. I was always proud to have him as a teacher and director. And now I feel honored to have him as a friend. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce a tribute from Cliff Hay. Oh <laughs> well, there's a reason that many of you have not seen my name or heard my name or any pictures of me, because I was I represent the technical group. Yeah. I was High, I got uh, a technical scholarship at the School of Performing Arts. 1966 was my graduating date. Uh, without the training from Jack, I'm sure I would not have gotten a complete full scholarship. Jack helped me to instill confidence that I needed to know that I could take on and do almost anything. Of course, uh, normally as a stage manager, my vision was to go on and be a stage manager on Broadway. But I've never stopped working long enough to uh, go there, and then all the times that I've been there, I've always been there with either shows or business, and I just keep on working. 
My final year in college, uh, the fourth quarter for my internship, I was asked to go up to uh, Santa Barbara and work in a movie, and then go on up to Ashland, Oregon, and work in the Shakespeare Festival. So I went to Santa Barbara, and I performed, or I actually worked as a, a uh, special effects person in, on a movie that I'm sure you're all familiar with, The Return of Count Jorgen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyhow, I'm sure that, uh, oh, and then I went on to Ashland, Oregon, and uh, stage manager in light for a year with the Ashland, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, and I thank you for all the teaching you did for me for Shakespeare, so I knew how to work it behind the scenes. Following that, I spent seven years as a stage manager, production manager on uh, a show called Disney on Parade. And so I've been almost all over the world uh, if, with that and other things that I've done you know, associated with theater or entertainment. The one thing I remember about Jack again, oh, he, he told me, you don't know what you can do until you really try. And that really stuck with me. Now, like I said, Jack instilled confidence in myself. But when he told me that I had to be an actor in a play, uh, the devil and Daniel Webster played Walter Butler. My first thought was, are you out of your mind? <laughs> um, I get nervous just standing in front of a group talking. And I'll probably sit here and talk for the rest of the night, just keep chatting. <laughs> after, after Disney, I was very fortunate to go on to Hawaii and open their new uh, multi-million dollar theater, which is now nothing. $3 million. But anyhow, I spent, uh, it was a, supposed to be a 10 week contract, and I spent nine months there. And I found out that the Polynesians think a little bit different than anyone else. They don't believe in manana. They believe that if it needs to get done, it will get done, and it will get done by exactly when it has to be done. We didn't do that in theater when we were here. Anyhow, I've, uh, again, I just want to thank you for the guidance you gave me and uh, the inspiration and having enough faith in me to keep me going. Thank you very much. I'd now like to uh, introduce Karen Kavanaugh Dorsey. Maybe not. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> Jack, uh, Brian Davis was going to be here tonight to do this portion, but uh, he was not able to, to, uh, to be here. So this is uh, the last couple of years in uh, your career here. And we started off <clears throat> with Othello. This Shakespeare production was excellent, and Jack's last at Kearney. It featured Leanne Moss, Brian Davis, Chris Segrist, Leanne Moss, again. <laughs> Wayne Riddle, Stephanie Jeffers, Eric Melkerson, Donovan Whitehurst, and Gretchen Murphy. It was followed by Barefoot in the Park. It's a good comedy, but unfortunately we don't know who was in it. Any barefooters here? Okay. That was followed by Social Security, which featured Chantel, and you're going to have to help me with this one, Eloy, Chantel Eloy, <laughs> and Gretchen Murphy. I think it's Murphy. The Good Doctor was also produced, but um, we don't know much about the folks in that show either. Brighton Beach Memories is a classic piece and challenged Brian Heath, Brad Murphy, and others. Creve Corps was introduced. The King and I in the Tea House of the August Moon both went to Mesa and were winners. Performers included Tu Yang, Brian Murphy, and Eric Diallo. So Jack, you came in a winner, and you went out a winner at 100%. All right, we've got a little, uh, a little video here from Brian Davis. Brian Davis is a news anchor now, and he has sent along a video for Jack. Brian Heap. Brian Heap, excuse me. Thank you. Oh, uh, we don't have that video? No? OK. Well, it'll be on the DVD. <laughs> Soon to be released. <laughs> this is
This is a tribute to you, Bobby. This is something that Jack gave me to read to you, and it's my pleasure to do so. We need to give our love and admiration to Bobby Winans, who had a tremendous impact, at least in the very least, by her costumes. We could not have had anywhere near the success we had in drama competitions without her. Almost from the beginning at San Diego State One Act Play Festival with our, with our first entry of Riders to the Sea, and then The Devil and Daniel Webster, which won the first superior rating and two scholarships, costumes were an important element. Kearney was noted for Shakespearean productions, for, for first Shakespeare in 67, while Bobby was pregnant with her son, J.R. She made 35 costumes for A Midsummer Night's Dream. 11 other Elizabethan plays followed. She, we could not have done those plays without her. Her talent and ability to change a thrift shop formula into an Elizabethan costume saved us thousands of dollars in costume rentals. I suspect thousands of dollars that weren't there. She deserves every bit to be part of this tribute as much for Jack as for you. I would like to give her my love and thanks for 28 years of costume. theater, you find the director, and then there's usually somebody around that director, and who is family. I think uh, Larry was talking about that earlier. It takes, it takes a village, but it also takes a family to produce a show. It seems that that's true, isn't it? especially when your life is dedicated to teaching and drama. Well, Jack, that's our bet. This has been our part. Now it's yours. You want to speak, Fred? First of all, I would like to thank the committee of Steve Crones and Gil Savage and Jeannie Frazier and Jeff Swain and Rick uh, Corlett and all of his people for putting this wonderful thing together. Secondly, I would like to thank... I would like to thank all of you for attending. Some of you from as far north as San Francisco, some from Las Vegas, some from the LA area. You have all had your effect on my life, of course. I am impressed by how many people felt that I was instrumental in changing their lives. I am impressed by how many of you still are involved with either teaching or working in the arts. It has been a wonderful evening for me, and I hope so for my wife and family. You all have had your own place in my heart. I'm very happy that I had that much effect. Thank you.
I just want to say thank you. It's been a loving event. And thank you, Jack, for all you've done for us. I get tired easy now. I'm getting there too. Yeah. <laughs> 